see applied behavior analysis in a different and refreshing light here at the Skinner Report. Hosted by Sarah Litvak and Anna Bullard, they shed light on what ABA therapy organizations need to know to level up their behavioral health services, helping every individual with autism meet their maximum potential. Join information-filled episodes with leading industry experts as they discuss every issue and update in the ABA scene, giving you an idea of what you can do to become a quality ABA organization and support the building of inclusive and comfortable workplaces in this side of the healthcare world. Here are your hosts, Sarah and Anna. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this uh, episode of The Skinner Report. We have with us today Adrian Bradley and Tia Glover, and we're really excited to talk to them about their organization, Black Applied Behavior Analyst. Thank you guys so much for joining us. I would love to hear a little bit about what is BABA. Who are both of you? You know, how did you get here today? What brought you here? And why did you decide to start Baba? So um, Adri and Tia, you guys go ahead. Yeah, thank you for having us today. Thank you, thank you. Um, to start, uh, you know, a lot of people have a misconception that um, myself or, you know, anyone that's currently on the eboard actually started Baba. That's actually not the case. Um, Kat Jackson started Baba um, from a Facebook page um, because she saw a need and a lack of representation in our field. And she was a BCBA in Alabama at the time and didn't see people who looked like her, didn't have the representation or anything like that, but was experiencing a lot of different microaggressions and just hardships at work. And so from there, you know, Facebook is a community. It brings people together and things like that before 2020. <laughs> um, and so I had was on Facebook just wondering also where are the other, you know, Black and African American individuals in the field? And I typed it into Facebook and then boom, Baba came up. So that that's really where the inception of, of Baba started. Um, Tia, I don't know if you want to say how you found Baba. Yeah, so kind of along the same lines as Adrian, I I was actually typing like, oh, I'm gonna try to start a Black Applied Behavior Analyst. I'm gonna try to do it on my own. And I typed it in and I saw it was already there. So then I did just like Adrian, I clicked and I joined the group and, and found it pretty enlightening. And that's what brought us here today. And I was going to say, I feel like, um, so I have um, a couple of friends in the community that are Black and one of my good friends, Helene Adedipi, I remember when the uh, the kind of Floyd situation happened, um, we were talking about everything that was going on. And she actually told me this, I hadn't heard this before. She was like, you know, Sarah, you were one of my only friends. I would go to a conference and like, I was the only black girl at these conferences. And you were the one person that came up to me at the bar and was like, Hey, what's your name? And this is like years ago. And she's like, you don't realize like how hard it is being black in the community where like, you don't see anyone that looks like you. Um, you know, and it's like, how do you find the feeling of comfort? How do you find the feeling of feeling connected to people that don't look like you? So, um, I think what you guys are building is incredible. And, you know, I think it's very timely and, it's, you know, I can't believe that we haven't had an organization like this before just a couple of years ago. Um, but tell me a little bit about like the impact you guys have made thus far. So, you know, you've been around for a couple of years now and, you know, what do you think has been the highlights of your organization since inception? Um, honestly, the fact that we exist and the fact that people in our community know we exist and know they have a home to come to. Um, I think that unless you are outside of the majority, you don't know what lack of representation does and how that affects the decisions you make on the day to day. And I think the biggest value is that there is somewhere for us to go. Um, not that other organizations aren't trying to do better with representation, but there's nothing like coming home to our community started by us and for us. Um, I think that's really been the biggest impact. And, you know, I think the other thing is that a lot of what we do is because of the lack of opportunity that our community receives and we provide those opportunities. We have trainings, we have different partnerships that Tia is involved in. And we are really strategic with, with our partnerships because 
Um, there's been a lack of opportunity for Black and African American individuals, whether people want to are ready to believe that or not. We wouldn't exist and need these partnerships if it wasn't the truth, right? So um, that's what that's what it's been for me, for sure. I think um, for me, uh, uh, to piggyback what, off what Adrian said, I believe that. It also does something for the people that aren't behavior analysts. In, in our Baba organization, we have people who are going to be behavior analysts or looking to be the behavior analysts. And what I really appreciate about it is that it provides that support, something that I didn't have coming in. You know, it's, it provides that support of someone that looks like me, that sounds like me, and can guide me in the right direction as well. So I think that's an imperative thing as well. What What does mentorship look like at Baba? Yeah, so um, we have a application that the mentor and mentee fill out. Um, we do um, make sure that values, areas of focus, time commitment, and things like that align. And then we send an email and we say, you know, here is your mentor, here is your mentee. This is a little bit about them. Um, they we connected you for X, Y, and Z reasons. And then they're required to meet at least once a month, right? So at least you're getting that, that mentorship monthly. And then if you decide to meet more than that, um, that's you know totally up to you guys. Um, but we are always looking for more mentors. Um, we do require that you are a black individual to be a mentor um, because there are just certain things that black practitioners and students are going through um, that we can connect with. Um, but we are, we're always looking for more Black mentors. I want to jump to the conference that you guys held in Detroit, uh, which was the, the weekend of Juneteenth, just a, a really exciting opportunity. But I don't want to miss um, the, also the opportunity to just ask you, how and why did you get into um, applied behavior analysis? Um, I, you know, I, I, I'm just always curious how, how each person gets into the field. Me, I fell into it. You know, I, I would think that most behavior analysts, I don't think that know about it going into it. I like all of us fell into it. So I didn't have a job straight out of college, and my mom worked in the field, and she actually is an auditor at the time. She was like, You should do it. I'm like, No, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. And then I know exactly what happened. I was working in an area, and I saw, um, I, candidly, I saw the bill that the behavior analyst gave my company and I was like at that moment I realized I was in the wrong field so I actually stopped getting my doctorate went back to school because at that point you had to have a certain type of master's degree went back to school a master's um and then became a behavior analyst and I don't think I will look back at all I just probably should have listened to my mom a little bit sooner right that that's usually how it goes right I mean that's it that's exactly how it goes I mean I have three girls too uh, that are out of high school and I'm pushing them into the medical field. Any type of, any time you look at a job, it's like, go into the medical field. Mm -hmm. um, that That's awesome. Yeah. And for me, I um, also didn't have a job coming out of college. Um, I realized that I didn't want to do what I went to college for. So mm -hmm. I had a little bit of thinking to do. Um, but I had got a parapro position in a local school district, and I um, was working in a self-contained ASD classroom, and it was really the lack of training and education that the special education teachers and the parapros had, and when we had behavioral kids, they would send the ASD consultant, but the ASD consultant didn't have to have any formal training, didn't have to have any kind of special degree or certification. Wow. And the thing that they were doing was really like masking the behavior. And I said, you know, you have a kid that's spitting and they said, well, give him a cut. Okay. So he's spitting in other mm -hmm. kids' mouths <laughs> and you said, give him a cut. Right. And so right. an older pair pro that had been there for years was like, have you looked in the ABA? And I was like, no. And then looked at looked it up and was like, oh, this sounds great. And um, I never looked back, never looked back. I now work for um, the school that I went to grad school for. So it's definitely a full, full circle moment. Wow. I love that. I just love always to know 
people's stories and how they they got to where they are. Um, but let, yeah, let's dive into the conference in Detroit <laughs> um, and talk about that. Uh, tell us how it went. What were the highlights? Um, I know it was exciting. Yeah, and it was just a couple of days ago, you know, so you are right. getting our like first initial reactions. And honestly, there's never, you know, there's never been anything like it in our field, period. You know, I know larger conferences and things like that occur, but the feeling that you, the energy you felt in the room was so powerful and impactful and grateful to just be there. Um, you know, you couldn't really describe it unless you were there. And that's what we've all been talking about, right? Is how, how do we describe the feeling that everyone felt, you know, being there and then learning from, you know, a whole lineup of not only black individuals, we had white individuals, we had Latina um, women, we had Latino men and um, just such a diverse lineup, all talking about different things and not just DEI in behavior analysis. And so um, you got to see that representation in our in our science. And it, I, I don't know, Tia, it was just so, um, it was warm, it was warm. Yeah, I think it it just had a different feel. I think a feel that a novel f feel to, for most people, for most attendees. You know, we've been to conferences, we've been to plenty of behavior analytic conferences, but we've never been to plenty of behavior analytic conferences with people that look like us. So that brought a whole different feel to the mm -hmm. conference. I will say it brought more of a of a family feel, if that makes sense. You know, um, yeah. being okay to be open. There would never have been a conference where people were crying at the conference. I've never seen that, right, never right. experienced that, and it never would be me, you know, until right. two days ago, you know, so I think that was probably one of the best things that I could say to, to take back, just knowing that I felt as though it was a family here. I felt as though, you know, usually I'll be honest, as a behavior, and when I go to the conference, I'm going just to get the CEUs and move on, but this one, I was engaged in the topics, engaged in what we're talking about. We're having these same conversations outside of the breakout room. So that was the, the biggest thing, just seeing the, 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 I think one, seeing how novel it was for everybody. Cause all of us, a lot of people had the same reaction that I had, like, this is different and being able to experience that and looking forward to doing it again. I can tell you right now, I'm, I'm ready to go already, you know, and knowing that our hard work paid off, you know, it, right. it's tiresome, the long nights, you know, especially for Adrian, uh, the log nights, everything, the stress, it does come back to full circle knowing that it was well worth it. So okay, Adrian, there's nothing better as someone who puts on a conference. There's nothing better than like the post-conference high afterwards where you look back and you're yes. like, wow, I did that. <laughs> yes, that's exactly how I feel. And I just think the biggest thing that I learned was Baba's impact. You know, there was history made at that conference and our impact is it's unvaluable whether well, people see it or not right? Can, right can you share some of the like announcements that you made I know there were a lot there was like an award ceremony there were, I mean tell us like you know don't yeah. be shy like get into the details like what what did yeah. we miss yeah, do you wanna, Tia can say one of the very first announcements we had because that was really you know you worked really hard on that yes yeah, so um one of the first announcements that we had and I don't you know Sitting back, I was on stage and I don't, don't think I took in the reaction when we said it. And then now sitting back, I'm like, the crowd really went crazy when we said that. Um, so what we had been working on, one of Baba's initiatives were to um, get some programs going in regards to ABA verified courses, the course sequence in historically black colleges and universities. So when I came on, I was working on that. Ironically, when I took my, my role as a partnership chair, I was already working on that. And I had already like done my due diligence trying to find a university that would um, support this initiative because ironically, it's really hard to get people to you know respond back to you with something they're unfamiliar with. Um, so I began working on that. So when I got this role, I brought it to Adrian. And she's like, this is what we're working on. We're already working on that. So I kind of just combined the two um, with my alma mater at Florida A&M University to announce that Florida A&M will be the first HBCU that would have a verified course curriculum for ABA, both the master's and undergraduate program. Wow. Um, and like I said, I don't think I was ready for um 
the reaction that we got I think in my head I'm like I'm so used to doing it I'm like oh this is just nothing else but Adrian said it and everybody went crazy and we were even especially um, thankful that the uh, chair for the psychology department the person who will be help has helped us with this initiative at Florida NM University was there as well to see this news and see the reaction of people as well. I mean, that is historic. I mean, I also was just thinking about the fact, um, if you recall a couple of years back, there was a lot of um, conversation around the fact that the BACB hadn't been really releasing demographic data about their certificates. And then they were like so fast to remedy that, right? Like they added the field and then people started filling it out. And then they ended up showcasing that, um, I think overall only 9% of certificates were black. Um, you know, and I think it was like 20% were Latino, but the, you know, they, you kind of mm -hmm. saw that the majority were white. And then you think about the populations that we work with and the fact that, you know, mm -hmm. people want to see themselves in their clinician and their doctor and their, you know, their, their medical treatment professional. And so we can't really do that if we're not allowing people to learn and grow into the role. And so, I mean, I can imagine why the crowd went crazy I and mean, it's a right. huge, it's going to make a huge impact on the patients who want to see themselves and the people they're working with. For sure. And and if you dig into that percentage, um, the higher you go, when you go to the B, B, A, C, B, C, A, B, A, and the B, C, B, A, it's, it's about 3%. Oh, you're so, so right. Cause I, I was looking on the overall page. I just pulled it's it over, up. Yeah. So that, yeah. yeah. It's 3.9% um, you know, black. So 4% for BCBA exactly, and BCAD. Exactly. And, and a RBTs lot of, are 13. And, yeah. And that's crazy. what we're saying. We're getting stuck in this hourly RBT role and we're not able to um, mm -hmm. do yeah. that, you know, BCBA, BCABA role. So it looks like, oh my God, it's 10%. That's great. Right. No, right. of that 10%, only 3% can actually do what, you know, we do. Right. right. And actually with that in mind, if we look at 53% um, of BC or all certificates are white. And then if I look at the BCBAD, 70% of those are BCBADs, right? So mm -hmm. like that number is so drastically high compared to those entry level roles. So it's a very good point. Mm -hmm. I think we, you know, there was, there was that announcement. And then I think my favorite part was honestly, um, the networking event and the awards event, right? And one of the things that Baba was very intentional on was supporting black owned businesses. And I think we can, for, we can forget that as conference organizers, we have large budgets. And if you look at where you're spending your money and how you can spend your money, are you diverse in that? And nine times out of 10, it's a no. You know, or like, yeah, we it's woman owned or it's a small business, but what about buy what about BIPOC businesses? And so both the awards event and the networking event were black owned venues. Everything in our swag bags were black owned businesses, including the bag and everything that Baba bought <laughs> to go in our swag bags. And so we were very intentional about who and where we're spending our money. And for, again, behavior analysis and Black people in behavior analysis, they're not used to that, you know? Um, and so, but the networking event, you were all Black-owned. It was at a wine store. We rented out the wine store. It was all Black-owned wines, Black chef, Black people, Black music, but everyone still felt welcomed and you were seeing all the hustles. I know a lot of people have been, you know, social media is blowing up, um, but just seeing that community and that family feel that Tia was talking about at a behavior analysis conference, right? Was, was the best part for me. And then, you know, we honored Dr. C. Richard Spates. And many people don't know about him because his names were not in the books. His legacy has not been talked about but he is a legend. He is a legend. And you see that happening a lot. You, you know, he is well into his seventies, eighties. He, you know, was in the psychology department at, at one of the most long lasting prestigious ABA programs, Western Michigan university. And no one really knows about him. And so to honor him and to see his, his reaction, he was very emotional. We got an email from him saying, I've never experienced this at any ABA conference, let alone in my personal life of just the appreciation and the honor. Uh -huh. And um, 
you know, what he has done for our community that yeah. no one knows about until we, you know, bring it to the forefront. I, I love that. And, you know, I want to ask you, like, why do you think that's the case that he's never, you know, had his day in the sun? But I was just going to comment that um, I felt the same way. I was at the we Book, the Women in Behavior Analysis Conference last week, uh, last year, and um, Nasaya Elezi was the keynote speaker. And I remember I just on a whim posted on LinkedIn that I had never seen a Black individual um, invited as a keynote speaker in all of my decades going to ABA conferences. And I remember just posting that being like, wow, this is history. And like the next day I woke up and it was like hundreds of people had like, like, and I was like, oh my God, like people like agreed that that's the case. And it, to me, I was just like, I didn't, I hadn't even thought about it. I just thought like, this is amazing. And I remember same thing, this I emailed me and was like that I like screenshotted that LinkedIn post, you know, because it was so meaningful to get acknowledged in that way. Um, but like, I'm just curious, like, why do you think that these people are not being acknowledged until just recently after years of making an impact? Well, I think no one cared. No one, no one cared. No one thought to care. And no one, we don't exist to a lot of people. You know, us as Black individuals in this field, we still get emails saying, well, why does there have to be a Black Applied Behavior Analyst organization? Mm -hmm. That's racist. Right, right. We got it two days before our conference, you know? Um, no I remember when, when Weba first started, I remember people were up in arms. Why do we need a women in behavior analysis conference? Right. Because there are so many women in the field. It's already women dominated. And I remember thinking, yeah, but I'm a woman and I've accomplished a lot. And the number of male keynote speakers at these conferences are exceedingly high compared to when I think it's changed a lot since we come out and I'm sure it'll change on the diversity side since black, since Baba has come out. But I think at the end of the day, everyone knows what it feels like to be an other, right. Whether you're a woman, whether you're black, well, you know, whatever it is, like, you know, I'm just thinking about even like a man who's short, right. Like he's like, ah, I wish I was taller, right. Like everyone yeah. knows how to feel like no, but I think you can't be someone else, you know? Right. But it's, it's three times worse when you're yeah. black and in America, you know, 100%. And that's just that's just period. And then when you're black and a behavior analyst and a community that has never seen you, right? Dr. Richard Spates helped start ABAI, one of the longest lasting organizations. He worked with Lovas. He's, he's worked with, you know, everybody that we talk about, everybody that's in our books, but you don't see him and you don't know him. Right. You don't know what he's done. And for the simple fact that we do not exist still to this day to many people. Right. And even Nasia, you know, Nasia speaking at WIPA was, she's been in the field for 30 years. Right. For 30 years doing the no. work yeah. at her house, <laughs> you know? Um, so there's still just a lack of, of caring. And is it at your frontal, right? Is it at the frontal or is it like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, um, I'm appreciative that you're bringing this to light and that people are able to hear that message because I, I think what I was trying to say about the others, like imagine the slight discomfort you feel about your other. Right. And it's, amp you, I think about how amplified it must be, um, you know, when, when you add race to it. Right. Um, or things that you can't really change. But um, I love the thoughtfulness around the business, the black owned businesses. I think there's just a level of detail that you guys provide that you rarely see a conference. I always joke, you know, when my partner Roni and I started the autism investor summit, we were like, we go to these conferences and they have like Cheez-Its and Ritz crackers. And like, you know, they just like, it's, it feels like they went to Costco and like bought a bunch of stuff and just like threw it on a table. And we like wanted to create something more special and unique. And it sounds like you guys did something really similar and thoughtful. And I know how much attention goes into that. It doesn't just show up overnight. So I hope everyone who attends realizes how much thought went into that. And um, I know that I wasn't able to attend this year, but I know that two of our um, team members were able to join and they were like raving about it. They said it was fantastic. So um, I was going to say, you know, to the idea of black owned businesses, um, we recently announced a partnership with Baba that's really focused on trying to benefit ABA professionals and make them aware of some of the issues that we just talked about, and then also help support black owned businesses as well. But do you want to give us a little bit of a hint about like what that partnership looked like and why that was important for your membership and, you know, happy to chat about what it means for us as well. 
one of the main things that happens when you have um when you're a person of color obviously um is that when you're getting everything started within your own organization um and you want to go for those those different accrediting bodies it's the main thing at least for me when I, we were developing this was giving people the opportunity to do that and when i say that I'm saying, um, you know, as we all know, those those fees can be a pretty hefty fee. So one of the, the main things that we're highlighting with this partnership is that they're able to get a 30 percent discount so that because you do want this accreditation, you need this. You can use this accreditation to help better your business um, and having that will also draw more eyes and attention to your business. So being able to assist with the with that financially was one of the biggest things, I think, for me, when we were developing this partnership. Um, and what what could you guys bring to the table as well as ourselves? Um, interchangeably, both of us are offering CEUs. Um, so we will do a CEU event for you guys or whatever CEU we have at that month, you guys will be able to attend. And on the flip side, we will have access to your learning hub, which will assist with the CEUs um, and a live webinars as well. I know Adam and I were talking about hopefully maybe doing some kind of Q&A for people who wanted to have the accreditation and just being being able to have that helping hand when it when it does come time for that accreditation and being able to do that because we've been through that it can be a long and hard process and you don't want to deter anybody from doing that and you want to have african americans having that accreditation from you also that was probably the bigger thing when we were developing this partnership and being able to empower our members um you know just making sure that they have the same thing that their white colleagues or their white counterparts or their white you know cohorts may have as well yeah i i love that and i think for us um you know we um have a section within our accreditation process on diversity equity and inclusion um, and there are certain requirements that we kind of have in place for our organizations to make sure that they're kind of upholding the values that we'd like to see in this area and so i think it was important for us too that um, we kind of help our organizations live and breathe this. So for us, what was exciting is if you do become accredited, you will receive one free BABA membership for your staff. So what that would allow us to do is uh, make sure that the hundreds of organizations we work with have representation at BABA and are able to have those important conversations and bring that back to their organization and kind of share what they've learned. Um, and I think the CEU piece is exciting because um, you know, we want to help black owned businesses continue to grow and thrive and learn. And so I think having your members access that is going to be really meaningful and then vice versa, you know, some of the content that you guys are putting out is something that is really meaningful to our population. So I'm really excited about it and it feels like mutually beneficial and it kind of pushes both of our missions forward in a way that I think will ultimately benefit the way the field operates. And then also just the way like staff are trained, the way that patients receive care. So it feels like a win-win across both organizations. Yeah, for sure. I think that for me, you know, just looking at the type of organizations that get this accreditation, right? They're the larger, the big ones that can afford to do these things, you know? So being able to empower our members to be able to say, hey, let's let's help you out here. You know, what can we do to help you out to, to help get this accreditation? Because, you know, it is it is a good accreditation to have mm -hmm. um, and something good to have up under your belt. So just being able to give that to our members and helping them thrive. That's yeah. what's just yeah. exposing them, right? Yeah. There's a lot yeah. that Black practitioners and Black-owned businesses don't know. And, you know, if you ask Adam, you know, I, I think being at the conference was really beneficial um, for BHCOE, but also for our black owned businesses, we will always have a business track because of the experiences that our practitioners are having in the field, they're starting their own, but many sure. don't know about accreditation because it's never it's not taught to them, it's not exposed, they don't have the opportunity, right? And so, and that's where our field is going, right? Like you guys have partners with insurance companies, so I can only imagine, <laughs> you know, what's gonna be coming here in the near future. And so we're also just about exposure and knowing that, that this is out there, this can help your yeah. business grow, this can validate your business ethically um, with quality care. Um, so I think that's that's my most exciting part is that our community will be exposed to something that aligns with us, right? Baba doesn't make sure. partnerships with everybody. You know, everybody. Sure. We feel very it. special. Thank you. We do. We love it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we, um, we just appreciate I, it. 
Well, thank you. And I was right back at you. I was just going to say one thing because you talked about kind of the larger organizations, Tia. And I've heard people say that before that we mostly work with large organizations. And that's like a slight misconception. I just wanted to correct it in case anyone is listening because our experience has been that the field is kind of divided into a large amount of small providers, like over under 250 staff, right? And then you have a few number of large providers that are maybe 40 of them that have thousand plus staff, right? Um, And so they may make up like the majority of the staff, but in terms of volume, there's only like 40 of them, whereas there's like thousands of small providers. And so we've actually found that our accreditation kind of matches the bell curve of where the field fits, right? So like we do, most of our providers are on the smaller end only because there's only 40 large ones, right? About half of them are accredited with us, but we spend so much time with small providers and we see them grow to scale. And so just for anyone listening, who's on the smaller side, just know a large amount of our providers started with us when they had one patient and today they have 200. Right. And it's been really, really exciting to see that progression of them coming to us five years ago with like a handful of patients and then seeing them grow into that. So, you know, we definitely work with all different sizes and now we've seen a lot of bigger ones leaning into accreditation as something that they need to do, but you know, we kind of see across the board, all sizes tend to engage in in that type of thing. Um, so anyways, I just want to put that out there because we get that sometimes. Um, I'm just thinking about Baba and you know, you were incorporated in 2019. What does the road ahead look like for you guys? So what's to come? You know, after this weekend, I think I'm like everything, you know, we need everything. Our community needs right, everything. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Um, but I think, you know, we have our strategic plan and we have our five-year goals and things like that. And that's what grounds us. Um, we would love to um, be, you know, more HBCUs, right? And we would love to help, help with that process, right? Um, being able to grow more BCBAs in research, you know, is there a journal article, you know, because a lot of people talk about these journals and what that looks like. Um, but I think, I think the other biggest thing, and, um, you know, I've been president for the last three years, and I was not, it was my, my journey to this presidency was not your typical journey. <laughs> um, I think Baba as a, as a baby organization and things like that has, has been through a lot, but um, I'm kind of ready to, to pass the baton. And so um, you'll hear it here first, with, you know, and we love our partnership with BHCOE. Um, actually, Tia Glover is going to be the new president of BABA starting in October of this year. So we are hey. really excited about that. Really excited about that. I was gonna say, I love that. And you didn't, cause we're on video, but you all listening can't see us. I just like did a ma- massive fist pump when you said that. So very, very exciting. <laughs> yeah, very exciting. Congratulations. Um, it's, I think it's gonna be awesome. And, you know, I know we're coming up on time here, but I, I wanted to ask the question for all of these organizations out there, um, who employ Black or African American staff, what can they do? And, and how can they lean on you guys to help promote their staff to become behavior analysts? Such a great question, Anna. Yeah, um, I would say don't lean on us, actually. <laughs> you know, I would say, you know, support and let expose your staff so that we let them know that we exist and we are here to help. But, yeah. you know, we're not in the business of, you know, we get a lot of emails of how can I increase my recruitment of Black individuals? Well, you're going to have to look at your policies and procedures and your representation, and that's on you. You know, we, we don't help with those things. Um, right. But what one of the things we will ask for our community is that there's an obligation to make sure that we still exist. Because if you're serving Black families, if you're serving or if you're employing Black RBTs and Black practitioners, our field is not in a state where everybody is is treated equal. It it doesn't happen. And that's just where we are currently. And so um, please make sure that we can still exist by supporting us and you know, we take donations, we take sponsorship when we do a call to action of like, hey, we got this HBCU, are we, we're looking for practicum sites, what does that look like? Mm. Um, that, that's, that's what I would say to you. I don't know if you had anything else. No, you hit it right on the head. <laughs> I, I love, love that. that. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good question, Anna. And I was going to say, let us know. I mean, we, we, I know we talk enough, but you'll let us know how we can help as well. So, um, and hopefully for our accredited providers who are listening, you'll, um, take this as a call to action to get involved in some way as well. Always. Thank you guys so much. I, I've been, I've just, you know, this has been really so enjoyable to have this conversation and to just hear from you. Uh, I feel like I definitely am coming to the conference next year. <laughs> Let me just say that. How many people had FOMO and we can't yeah. do anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I joined last year virtually and I loved it mostly because I got to listen to every talk, every talk, like from a beach chair. Like I remember I was, <laughs> it was the weekend of father's day, similar to last year. And I was with my husband and I was like, I'm so sorry. I have to listen to this. Like we were like by the pool. <laughs> But um, yeah, we'll definitely have to be there in person next year. And thank you so much for all that you do. And we appreciate you taking the time to come and chat with us today. That's it for today's episode of The Skinner Report. By allowing yourself to be inspired and educated through this podcast, you are now one step closer to growing, building, or starting your own ABA practice that can impact the behavioral landscape. Continue nourishing your heart and mind right here by listening to more of our episodes at bhcoe.org. Be sure to subscribe to the show and leave a positive rating. Let us make the ABA scene safer, more caring, and more connected than ever before. Thank you for joining us. See you on the next one.